All right. Welcome, everybody. This is a very exciting American IRA presentation. We have the star of a es hit TV show, Flip This House, Mr. Peter Pasternak with us today. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Sean, for inviting me on the show today. Absolutely. So for those of you listening, if you're a real estate nerd like myself, this is uh, this is kind of a dream come true to have someone who's, uh, you know, been a star of a hit TV show, someone who's incredibly well versed in real estate investing concepts, who's willing to share a little bit of their time and expertise with us. So uh, certainly this is a, a definite upgrade from the uh, webinars that I typically do where I'm just talking about uh, our self-directed concepts. We have someone who can really uh, further the conversation in a lot of ways. So very, very exciting stuff. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping notes. Uh, we do have a questions box for those of you that are signed in live to the webinar. So certainly feel free to type in any questions that you have. Uh, more than likely, we will just wait until the end of the webinar and presumably a large portion of those questions will probably be for Peter. Uh, so we'll be able to uh, dig into those and, and he can share his knowledge with us. Uh, in terms of the flow of this webinar, we'll be discussing kind of the fundamentals of self-directed concepts for the first, say, 10, maybe 15 minutes. And then we'll turn it over to the main event, Mr. Peter Pasternak, so he can once again uh, share his knowledge with us. So we'll go ahead and dive right into it. So when we're talking about retirement accounts, I think it's really important for us to understand what many of us are currently doing with our IRAs and 401ks. So there are what I consider defensive investments, such as CDs and money markets, where we're really just trying to make sure we're not losing the principal money that we've put into these accounts. And then there are investments that are seen to be growth vehicles, where if we put money in, the expectation is if we make a good decision, these accounts can grow in value. And so for many of us historically, that's been in the form of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. And so those can really be great tools for us. If you get nothing else out of this kind of mini self-directed presentation tonight, hopefully you understand that this is not a complete list of options for us as it pertains to our IRAs and 401ks. There's a, there's a wide array of investment opportunities beyond just stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. It's also really important that as investors, we do an analysis as to how well we understand what we are investing in. So again, we have presentations like the one today with Peter, where he'll share his story about real estate investing. And if you're a real estate investor and you're, you're wanting to go down that path, it may make sense to use a portion of your retirement account to invest in what you're studying and what you're becoming proficient at. Uh, unfortunately, what, when we look at statistics, we find that the majority of people have their money in the stock market. However, a very small percentage of us actually really follow the market, read the annual reports, and understand the technicals of these companies and these products we're investing in. So the premise of these self-directed accounts is just simply to invest in what you understand. So when we talk about a self-directed retirement account, hopefully we understand two primary concepts. The account is, as the name indicates, a self-directed account, meaning that you as the account holder are making the decisions for your portfolio. So at American IRA, we are not advisors that are picking investments for you. You are driving the conversation. You are identifying the asset that you're interested in investing in. And certainly you're probably going to lean on a team of experts and individuals around you that can help you make that decision, but you're not just simply giving American IRA a chunk of your retirement account and asking us to really just kind of take, take the ball from there and make good decisions on your behalf. It is truly self-directed. Now, the second concept is when we talk about a truly self-directed retirement account, again, you can still invest in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds with us at American IRA, but frankly, the main benefit of our service is investing in what we consider alternative assets. So that can be the direct ownership of real estate. It could be lending money, and many times that is secured also by real estate. It can be investing in privately held companies, sometimes called a private placement. 
and investing in precious metals such as physical ownership of gold and silver and palladium and, and assets like that. So that's certainly not a complete list, but just to kind of get your mind working. Now at American IRA, we are considered the administrator for the retirement accounts. Again, we are not advisors picking products for you. We are simply a record keeper that allows you to invest in a wide array of assets. We are what's considered a fully integrated company, meaning that we are we have the same ownership group for our administration company, American IRA, as we do for our custodial bank, or excuse me, our custodian, New Vision Trust Company. So really the benefit to our clients is that being fully integrated, we're not going to be getting a letter from our custodian saying you have 30 or 60 days to find a new custodian because we're no longer in this business model, which is really pretty scary for those administrators in the self-directed arena that are not fully integrated. So our ownership group, our principal, Jim Hitt, has done a fantastic job of working with our operations team over the last few years to make sure that we're fully integrated and we're protecting our client base. Now, the slide actually needs to be updated. We're actually closing in on almost half a billion dollars in assets under administration. So while we'll never be the Bank of America, the Wells Fargo in terms of size of assets, we're a pretty substantial player in this space. Now, we're... we're considered a national firm and we're actually expanding our reach with physical offices. Our headquarters is in Asheville, North Carolina. Most days I'm located in our Charlotte, North Carolina office. And we've also over the last six months opened an Atlanta office in Atlanta, Georgia. And that was actually uh, the, the way that we were introduced to, uh, to Peter and his team. Our rock star sales rep down in Atlanta, Sable, uh, has created a re excuse me has created a relationship with Peter over time. And uh, again, Peter was gracious enough to uh, spend some time with us and share information. So uh, we're very grateful to be able to be continuing to expand our reach and uh, helping as many clients as humanly possible. And certainly, a question we get regularly is what separates American IRA from other self-directed firms. And to me, I think there's a few elements that separate us. One is when you look at our fees, most self-directed firms are going to be charging you money as soon as you establish the account with them. The annual fee kicks in, and there's a battery of fees that are kicking in before you're making investments with the company. Uh, we have a free cash account, meaning that your annual fee for our IRAs does not kick in until you make your first investment with us. So you're not panicked to feel as though you have to have activity to justify these fees that you are paying. Also, with most self-directed firms, what you find is that the annual fee increases as you grow the size of your retirement account. Now, our premise is that since we are not actually making investment decisions for you, it's unfair for us to charge you more money each year just simply because you're doing a great job growing your retirement account. We also have a lot of expertise in-house. We have a senior staff that has been with us eight, nine, ten plus years. I've been very fortunate to be with this firm uh, for almost 11 years now. And so it's a fantastic opportunity for us to be able to grow and to be able to have a real relationship with our clients over time. And also just simply the reality of the self-directed space being that most educators, most individuals that are out there discussing the self-directed concept are not actually investors themselves, ironically. We're very different at American IRA from our principal, uh, Jim Hitt, who's a prolific real estate investor. Um, I've certainly worked very hard over the last uh, decade plus to become at least an adequate uh, investor from private lending, tax liens, building a rental portfolio. And many of us have actually created seven figures in net worth because we are investors. We don't just simply talk about these investments. We are out there actually making it happen ourselves. So I think that there's a real benefit when our clients are talking to us and they understand that we're actually in the trenches and we're investors ourselves. We understand the nuance of the deals that they're doing. So uh, that's our spiel at American IRA as to how we feel as though we're different in providing value.
Now, as you look at these self-directed accounts, keep in mind that the retirement account itself is not going to be changing forms typically. If you have a Roth IRA with SunTrust Bank or Bank of America, you'll still have the same Roth IRA if you decide to move all or just simply a portion of that to us. Same is true with tr traditionals, with SEPs, with simples. All these accounts stay in their same form. Now, if you have an old employer-sponsored plan like a 401k, a 403b, or a thrift savings plan, many times that will roll over into another pre-taxed account, many times a traditional IRA with us at American IRA. And again, these accounts do not need to be entirely moved over to us. You may just have a use for a third or half or three quarters of your portfolio to be moved over for a particular investment opportunity. So keeping in mind, when we say self-directed, the only thing that's changing with these retirement accounts is just a wider array of investment options. Now, as you look at the investment options, the interesting thing is that the way the IRS code is written is it simply tells us what we cannot invest in, which is basically collectibles and life insurance policies. So all types of physical real estate can be owned by your retirement account. So it can literally be 123 Apple Street in Atlanta, Georgia, for example. That can be directly owned by your retirement account. So everything from raw land to condos, townhouses, single family houses, commercial buildings, industrial buildings, apartment complexes can all be owned by these retirement accounts. And again, depending upon the state you live in, either the mortgage or the deed of trust, essentially being the bank for other investors, can be accomplished with your retirement accounts as well. Now also LLCs is a structure that we see a fair amount of where maybe it's a single retirement account that is a member of an LLC, or maybe there's a capital raise, what's called a syndication for maybe a large deal like an apartment complex. And so a retirement account can be a member of this LLC that will then go on to buy an apartment complex. So it can be essentially one of many owners for a particular asset. And as we mentioned earlier, tax liens, tax deeds can also be purchased by your retirement account. Now, as you look at the real estate strategies, and certainly I believe Peter's going to touch a little bit on this today, uh, but any of these investment real estate strategies can be uh, completed, can be accomplished with your IRA or 401k. So everything from buying rental properties to doing a fix and flip deal, uh, if you're working off market deals where you're wholesaling or you're doing options on a property, uh, those can also be done with your retirement accounts. And as we just mentioned, joint ventures is really just another way of saying a partnering deal. So your retirement account may own a portion of a condo, it may own a portion of a big apartment complex. And private lending is just simply the act of being the bank and lending money many times to other real estate investors and getting many times an above average return on your investment dollar. Sometimes that's called hard money lending. So a lot of different ways that you can involve your retirement account. So as you look at this visual, just simply keep in mind that essentially the IRA is many times going to pay cash for an asset, whether that's a rental property, whether that's a loan, and that, that money flows to that asset. And then as that asset either produces income via rent or from the sale of that asset, that money flows back to the retirement account because that retirement account is in fact the owner of that asset. So again, want to make sure we have plenty of time here for the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Mr. Peter Pasenak, who was the star of the uh, hit TV show, Flip This House, the, the Atlanta series, which was a lot of fun for uh, many of us to watch. And so, Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, John. You know, first of all, I love listening to your part because before I get to me, I always say this when I'm mentoring and dealing with people. I think that probably one of the least understood way of funding deals are self-directed IRAs. And so, um, you know, I, I talk about them a lot with people and I always get this like very like scared look, <laughs> like I'm crazy, which we all know I'm a little bit crazy, but you know, that's a whole nother discussion we're going to have. 
so um, I, I, I love hearing this because, like I said, I think education is so important to people. So first of all, let me tell you a little bit about myself, my background, and everybody always, the first question people really want to know is how did I end up on television? So we're going to get there. But uh, first of all, a little bit about my background. I am a graduate of the University of Georgia. Uh, I have an undergraduate and master's degree in accounting. I am a CPA that started my work career at Price Waterhouse. Now, people, when they meet me, they always talk about my energy because I'm a high energy guy. And I said, okay, so I'm 59 years old. Can you imagine me 36 years ago in a little cubie hole at Price Waterhouse? It was just not a great fit for my personality. But um, I always say that as an entrepreneur, understanding your numbers and accounting is really a foundation uh, of success. And I always think about Mr. Wonderful for all the people that wa watch Shark Tank. So, all right, so after uh, leaving Price Waterhouse, I went to the banking world. I was a banker for 20 years. Uh, I started as a bank auditor, and at the end, I was a bank president. And so uh, I always am just so passionate about um, business, and entrepreneurship and helping people and understanding. Uh, I always say if people ever saw what loan committee was, which is where you decide if you're going to get money, th thanks for helping me on my uh, slides. I start talking sometimes and I get a little bit behind on my slides. So thank you for helping me here. Um, if people ever saw what happened at a bank and how to, um, how they decide whether you're going to get money or not, I swear they would never go to a bank again because um, bank committee is almost like chicken little. Like, how do, you know, how is the bank going to get their money back if, the, you know, the, the worst things happen? And so um, it's not a real positive, but it gives you a different thought process. So um, I've seen so many different types of businesses. I've lent money to so many different types of businesses that um, I have a good feel for what the challenges are in whether they're service, um, manufacturing, distributors, all that type of uh, good stuff. All right. So growing up in Connecticut, my dad owned a Dunkin' Donuts. And uh, so I grew up in an entrepreneurial um, household. Uh, 2004, I got in touch with my entrepreneur. I left the banking world. Uh, I had an opportunity to uh, buy one of my clients. It was a 300-employee commercial printing company. So I did that, and within a year, I bought six other companies. Uh, they all needed print, printing, so uh, had a lot of vertical integration. Um, during that time, I met my best friend, um, business partner, Brian Tro. Uh, Brian was my personal trainer, and Brian's about 15 years younger than I am. He's kind of like a, my little brother that I never had. And um, we were in my basement one day, and I said to him, Brian, what do you really want to do when you grow up? And I tease him, I'm still asking him today, like, Brian, what do you want to do when you grow up? <laughs> and he said, I want to get into real estate investing. And so if you understand, at this point, I own and I'm running seven companies. I'm working seven days a week. I'm working 100 plus hours. So I did not have a lot of time um, to do that. But I wanted to help Brian. And so I said, okay, let's do this. I said, now, I only have about three or four hours a week. I really can, like, devote to this. But the problem with me is, you know, I'm, I have very strong type A personality. And once I start something, it's very hard for me to, like, just do it a little bit. So at that time, I started watching uh, Flip This House was on in some different locations. And one of the things I realized is if I was going to be an investor, I, I needed a uh, realtor that understood investing. And think about this. In less than a year of doing real estate investing, we were on our fourth flip. We end up on national television. What? How crazy is that? Less than a year and on our fourth flip and end up on national television. Now, that's what some people how they would look at it. But I'm going to give you a different view here. What the um, network liked about Brian and I was 
in 2005, let me say this, when you told people you were a real estate investor and flipped homes, they thought it was illegal. And the reason they thought that was, there was so much in the news about mortgage fraud that people just thought that flipping was mortgage fraud, which of course it's not. Mortgage fraud is illegal. And so what the um, network liked was not that Brian and I had been only doing this for a year, but they loved to be able to say our company and our bios went on there, that I was a CPA, that I worked at Price Waterhouse, that I was a banker and a bank president. So it gave some credibility to real estate investing. And so I, I always like to share that because it, it, it's always interesting when people take a look at what they think somebody else has been lucky or they just happen to be successful. And I can tell you, I've, I've done so many different things in my 59 years, but here's the common thread. There's not an easy way to make money and there's not an easy way to make money. And be clear that just because you watch something on television and it's a 45 or 50 minute, uh, I would say reality TV is not total reality. You know, um, our flips took about 12 to 14 weeks to complete, and they were with us basically 24 seven, and you saw 45 to 50 minutes. Um, and so you didn't see every morning when I was up at 4 a.m analyzing deals, looking at things. And, um, you know, it, it's a shame they don't show that because it, sometimes I think people get into this thinking that it's easy. Um, and it's not. Uh, the other thing I think reason people thought this was easy was a lot of people back in 2004, five, six, were making a lot of money and thought they were good at flipping homes. And they weren't. What they were good at was they were taking an asset, which is the real estate, and it was appreciating, right? It was going up, and real estate goes up, you know, historically higher than returns on the stock market. And so it wasn't until the market really changed where value started to get flat that you really had to figure out how do I add value to houses and homes versus just holding it and not doing much and just having an, um, an asset that appreciated. So that's how we ended up on TV. They, um, the other thing they liked about Brian and I was um, we're very different personalities. Brian's a, Brian's a little more outgoing. No, no, Brian's not a little more outgoing. Brian's a laid back one. I'm a little bit more um, out there. Uh, Brian ran uh, all the things on our construction site and I basically took care of everything else. The running the business, the marketing, analyzing the numbers, um, making sure we're in compliance, you know, all those good things. Um, people ask me, it, it's amazing that people still remember because uh, the show has been off almost 10 years now. Now, there have been a lot of uh, copycats and there are a lot of other shows on flipping, but I always say, just like going to a movie, the first is always the best, the sequels never live up to it. Um, but there is, right? I mean, it's never, whether it's a book, whether it's a movie, it's just never the same. Um, but I'm glad we did the television show because what it did is it added credibility um, to who we are. It created opportunities um, to get properties that were off market. Um, I had banks that would call me, um, you know, and say, hey, before this goes to the market, a lot of things were in foreclosure or um, short sales, um, they would give us the opportunity to look at things. So um, I'm grateful that we had the opportunity uh, to do that. So that is a little bit about background and how we got on TV. If you have any more questions, um, we're, I guess we're gonna take these at the end. So what I wanna talk about today is, we're gonna get to some of the real estate investing. Um, I have so many people that come to me and they go, we want to get into flipping homes. I'm like, okay, so tell me, like, why do you want to do it? And they, they don't really know. They just heard it's a great way of making money. And um, it, just like anything else, if you're going to put money into a business um, and be very clear that flipping homes or whether it's buy and hold or wholesaling is a business. If you don't make money, it's a hobby. 
I'm going to say that again. If you do not make money, it's a hobby. We all have plenty of hobbies. And so you, you have to treat this like you would any other business deal or venture. Um, so I think it's important. The first thing you really want to consider is what is going to be your real estate um, investing strategy? So let's just talk about three of the most common um, forms. And I, the reason it's important to understand this is a lot of times the homes that you're going to be looking at are different. So let's start with um, rental properties or uh, buying holds, as I call them. So that's where you're going to find a property. And uh, typically, an investor is going to put anywhere from ten to $15,000 into that property to get it ready to rent. Now, Ten to fifteen thousand is not a lot of money. Be clear. You have to have a house that has good bones. Um, you've got to make sure it. You're not going to knock down any walls. There's going to be nothing structural um, in it. Um, you want to make sure that uh, you're just like updating stuff. So it might need a, a fresh coat of paint. Um, you might need to update the the kitchen. Um, maybe the bathrooms in there. Um, but you don't want to overspend. Because remember, when you're renting it, um, people are going to be tough. It's not their home. They're renting it. And so um, a lot of times you're going to have to, you know, do things over and over. If they move out, you're going to have to, if you have carpet, you're going to have to put more carpet. If you've got hardwood, they get scratched, um, you know, paint. They put pictures on the uh, wall. Um, but the good thing about rental properties is it can really help your cash flow. Um, and what I mean by that is you want to make sure that you're, you have more money coming in than it's going out. Um, and, you know, people always talk about the um, importance of having residual income. And what residual income is, is you don't really have to do anything that day and your money's still making money. So if you've got rental properties and you've got, um, you know, when, when you start getting more, it's advisable to have a um, property management company uh, manage the properties for you. I'm a big believer of that. Um, I use that for my rental properties. And so as long as they've got, they find a person to lease the properties and take care of the maintenance, when I say you have maintenance, you're still paying for the maintenance, but make sure you've got the electrician, the plumber, the, um, you know, whoever needs to come out. And so you're making the cash flow, you're getting money every month. And then a lot of times, uh, at the end or the back end, you're making money when you sell the property, okay? So uh, uh, typically a buy and hold investor is somebody who is interested in cash flow. Okay, that's your rental property, your buy and hold. Now, fix and flip, which is really um, what people typically talk about flipping homes. Um, you gotta have a big, you gotta have a lot of, um, appetite for the unexpected right um and then maybe someday uh sometime sean you're gonna invite me back i don't have time but i like to talk about the four levels of flipping homes right it goes from everything to doing cosmetic i call that level one level two is you do structural but don't add any square footage level three is structural um knocking down walls and adding square footage and fourth is like new construction and um, you don't go to level four when you first start. That, I would not advise that. But um, if that's something that people like to talk about, I would love to come and talk about the pros and cons of each level. Uh, so all flips are not, not the same, right? There's, there's more in it. Um, now, the thing about fixing and flipping homes is to begin with, most people don't know what they don't know. So, after a show, like I said, um, an average rate of people, about a million and a half to two million people uh, were on the show. And afterwards, uh, I was always at my computer and my phone. I probably got, mm, e well, emails and phone calls, about 1,500 to 2,000 um, people after each episode. And a lot of times people were surprised when I picked up the phone. And here was like a normal conversation. Oh my God, Peter, I, that sounds like you. It can't be, but it is. I've answered my phone. All right, so <laughs> not a deal. I, I just want, right? I'm like, oh, I talked to myself. Yes. 
so um, this was how most conversations started. Um, hey, listen, Peter, I need to find money because I've got this most incredible deal. So I'll be like, all right, so tell me about the deal. Well, I can get this uh, property for $70,000 and the properties in the area are selling for $200,000. So, uh, so where do I get the money for that? I said, well, wait, 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 let's, let's slow down a little bit here. So let me ask you this. What's it going to take to turn the house at $70,000 into looking like and being like that $200,000 home? Well, now it got very quiet. So I said, and so I said, let me explain to you. I never fall in love with properties. I fall in love with the numbers. I'm going to say that again. I don't fall in love with properties. And as an investor, you shouldn't. You fall in love with the numbers. So I said, here's the deal. You buy that property for seventy thousand. If it costs you one hundred eighty-five thousand to fix that, you're at two fifty-five, right? The property is only worth, let's say, two hundred. You now have lost fifty-five thousand, but more because you have holding costs and other things. It's not a good deal until you understand all of the components. And so, you know, the the two large numbers when you're doing um, fix and flip is you have to know the ARV, and ARV is after repaired value. That is, what is the house going to be worth once the scope of work is being done? Okay, and so if you don't have that number, you're going to be in trouble. So you have to know the ARV, what's it going to be worth, and then what is the cost to do the scope of work? And if you think something is going to cost 50 or 60 thousand and it costs 130 or 140, and I can tell you this, I have walked around properties with many, many investors, and I typically will say, how much do you think it's going to do, cost you to do the scope of work? And most of the time, it's maybe half they come up with of what it's going to cost. So think about that. If it's 125000 and you think it's sixty, and you work the numbers, and you think you're going to make twenty or 30000 you now, because you're off sixty grand, it, you just have a loss. And people are like, what? Because you don't know what you don't know. So Flipping homes, again, you've got to know what the ARV is, what the house can sell for, what it's going to cost to get that work done. If you're off uh, big on either of those numbers, you're going to have a problem. But here's the, uh, here's the uh, upside. There's a lot of money to, to be made in flipping homes. Now, a lot of times I get asked the question, uh, what's the best time to flip homes? And can you make money regardless of the market? So the best time to make money in flipping is when prices are going up. Because when you are working your numbers and you think your ARV is X in today's market, and it takes you six months to do that and the market's going up, then probably your ARV is going up. But you still can make money when it's flat or going down. If the market's going down, um, what can happen is you have to project what you think it's going to go down. So let's say it's going down 3% and it's going to take you six months. So you have to factor that in to figure out whether or not, you know, what your ARV is going to be. Now, I would tell you this. I made more money in 2010 and 11 than any other year. What? How can that be? The market was in the downfall because this is what I'm telling you, folks. When Real estate values are going down. It's the best time to buy, whether it's a buy and hold or flip, because cash is king. I bought a couple lots that um, I never built on. I just held on to them, so I had no mortgages. And um, by the time the market changed uh, and people came back, I made well over six figures on uh, each of the lots that I bought and never touched them. So when people go, can you make money if there's going to be a crash? Yes. If you think there's going to be a crash, which I don't believe there is, I think there is going to be a small um, adjustment in pricing. We're starting to see that in Atlanta even now. Um, if you do a good job with your finances and you build up your cash reserves, it's an awesome time to invest. All right, that's fix and flipping, wholesaling. So uh, I haven't done lots of wholesaling, but um, I had a lot of people that would come to me and ask me like how to wholesale. So um, 
couple years ago, I learned, and I've done some wholesaling, and that's really where a lot of people start as investors because wholesaling is about finding off-market deals, right? And you're going, you're finding them, and uh, a lot of times you do not need a lot of money um, because you're putting your you're going to the seller, you get the listing, and then you're uh, finding the buyer, and basically you're putting them together, and uh, you can have one where um, if it's going to close at the same time or a day or two apart, there's things like trans uh, transactional funding that can do that. There's different ways, but you don't need oodles of money, and it's a great way of learning because when you're wholesaling, uh, if you're going to be a good wholesaler, you've got to start learning how to get that ARV after a period. But I, I would tell you this. If you ask an investor what an ARV is and they don't know, guess what? They have not been doing this because that is a common term that all investors uh, use. Um, and so it, it gives you good practice um, of figuring out how things would cost because if you're marketing it, a lot of times you're talking about what the ARV is and what you think it would cost to get it done. Um, so that, like I said, that's where a lot of uh, beginning investors, they start off in wholesaling. Uh, private card money lending. Um, there are people that, that get into that because they want, and, and I heard uh, Sean talking about it, they're looking for a higher rate. Um, but I would tell you this, if you're going to lend money to people and hard money, you still got to figure out what your after repaired value is going to be and how much it's going to cost because you have to margin what you lend to somebody. So here's what I mean by that. If it's going to, let's say somebody's got a property, or let's, let's just use a stock, for example. People understand this better. You have stocks that are worth $100,000. A bank's not going to lend you 100000 on that stock. They're going to lend you maybe sixty-five dollars or 70000 That's what they call a margin. It's a percent um, less than 100 Because if you have to take it back, it, there, there's a cost of doing that. So if you're a hard money lender or a private lender and you're lending to other people and you have to take back and foreclose on the property, there's cost involved in that. And so you still have to keep up with that after repair value and what that stuff is going to cost. So um, those are some of the strategies for investing. Now, let me see if I go to the next slide here. Uh, all right. Today's real estate market, make money with real estate. I will tell you this, and I say this all the time, you take a look at all of the millionaires and billionaires over, I think it's 89% have real estate in their portfolio. What? Let's say that again. Almost 90% of the wealthiest people have real estate in their portfolio. Why? Because real estate is the absolutely number one appreciating asset. So if you're going to build a portfolio, why would you not have real estate in there? And so, you know, I love when Sean and people American Iron, when they talk about, you know, it's self-directed in your IRA. So you get to direct, you've got to have real estate in your portfolio, guys. I mean, it's just, it's just a no brainer to be doing that. All right. Um, let me see, what is on this next screen? So many times I go outside of it. Buy and hold or flip. All right, so here's what I tell people. You start by figuring out your strategy on whether you are looking to be a cash flow, um, and cash flow is to be a buy and hold, or flip, you're gonna get most of your money when it sells. So it's quick up, but you don't have the residual, and you don't have the stuff on the back end. And again, it's really important that you get this because like I said, the type of houses you're gonna look at are very different. A buy and hold has to have good bones. They typically have to have good mechanicals. So when I talk about mechanicals, there are three things that are mechanicals. Plumbing, electrical, HVAC. That's plumbing, electrical, HVAC. I want you to get nothing more from today why that's important. If you look at a house, the most expensive thing to fix are the mechanicals. I would tell you on a typical, if you're gonna put new systems in, I did not say repair, I said new, for plumbing, electrical, and HVAC here in Atlanta, and let's say it's about 1,500 square feet, uh, new stuff that's gonna probably be, uh, be between 20 and $24,000, okay? So that's more than the 10 or 15 we talk about on buy and hold. 
So uh, something that needs all new mechanicals is typically not a good candidate for uh, a buy and hold property. Um, but flip gives you an opportunity to create value. And, and again, if um, Sean, if you guys invite me back and I talk about, I will tell you the secret sauce of what I've used to make a lot of money flipping homes. Um, and about those four levels and, and how you go from the cosmetic level one to just um, structural, but not any square footage, which gives you the ability to open up floor plans. Three, is, and three is to me where the big money is and where I, I do a lot of my stuff is knocking down walls and adding square footage on there. And then fourth, again, is the new construction. So important to know, again, if you're buying hold, you're typically a cash flow, you're more um, um, focused on that. Flipping is more about, um, you know, making money quickly. All right, so I think the next slide here, let me, funny, funny, okay, so I love this. When I meet with people, the two biggest questions people have is how do I find it and how do I fund it? All right, now, let me be clear. The first piece of advice I give to any investor is this. Have your financing set before you look at houses. I'm gonna say that again. Make sure you have your finances in place before you go looking for property. In today's environment, there are a lot of uh, areas that inventory levels are low. You cannot go and find a property and now figure out where the heck you're gonna fund it. That is horrible. A lot of times you have to make quick decisions on whether you're gonna put an offer or not. And if you don't have your finance in place, a lot of times you're gonna lose a lot of the good deals. So, um, you know, we've talked about funding. Um, Self-directed IRAs are great. And the reason it's great, just so you understand this, and I'm not an expert, so if I say something wrong, Sean, stop me here, right? But one of, to me, the great advantages of self-directed IRAs is it's your money. So when people say, well, how much are you paying for it? You're not paying for anything. It's your money. So a lot of times people, when they think about investing property, they think about hard money. They think about hard money because that type of financing will pay for the acquisition and for the work that's being done, okay? But hard money is expensive. It's typically, um, I would say at a low, is 8 to probably 14% in your paying point. So a lot of times, um, if people have self-directed IRAs, it, A, they might want to fund all of those, or the other big word today is leverage. Leverage is you may not want to put all your money in one deal. So you might want to put part of it. So uh, when you've got a self-directed IRA, you can use part of that and also use other forms of financing. Now, I know there's usually an exception, which is you can't be a guarantor on um, the other sources, or I think you get timeline violation for the self-directed IRAs. But, you know, think about it. If you got a good deal and you don't want to pay, you know, 8, 10, 12, 14%, and you've got part of your money, and let's say you put half of it in there and half of it in the others, it brings your average rate of the money that you're paying for down significantly. And I would tell you this, where you can make or break a deal when you're flipping home is your holding cost. And the biggest part of your holding cost is your cost of financing. And so you have got to understand this because when you're determining whether a deal is good or not, um, you've got to make some assumptions for how long it's going to take you to sell the property. You're going to hold on to it. Um, you know, what your monthly um, interest is. And so this is a big, a big part of it. So um, I would just tell you this. I would never, 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 how often, never go and look at a property if you don't have the financing in place. You just don't want to do that. Now, the other big thing that people ask is how do I find properties? And so, you know, I, I'm a big believer. I've always used real estate agents to help me finance, uh, find property. The reason for that is, now, I've, I, I should say, uh, I've used them and sometimes in conjunction with wholesalers. Wholesalers are good, but here's the thing. When you find a realtor, and that realtor has to understand investing, 
all realtors are not the same. And I actually teach a class on the information realtors need to have in order to have credit bid with investors. They have to understand what ARV is. They have to understand certain things because in a short period of time, you're looking to make money. And there's, there's certain things they need to be able to share with you. Um, but what I found is they can help you with the ARV. It's like they're going on a listing appointment and you know, figure out what the value of that home is going to be when it's done. They can give you some good suggestions. And um, if you're off on that, like I said, that is really going to hurt you. And uh, a lot of times with wholesalers, you have to be careful because a lot of times they inflate that ARV uh, because they're not the ones selling it. And a lot of times the realtor, you're using them. And if you're using them on both ends to buy and sell, they are incented to make sure they're giving you the best information possible. So um, realtors are good. You know, wholesalers, there's, uh, there's other ways if you want to, like, look for your own properties but i would tell you this i would not talk about those when you're a beginner you don't want there's so many other things you need to focus on that i would get the expertise of somebody to help you find but finding and funding very important all right um i think i'm gonna get this slide here that's gonna talk about oh what is the number one mistake that most investors make all right here it is this is not your own personal home do not make decisions based on your personal like life. So if your personal favorite color is purple, do not be painting rooms purple because here's the thing. In business, it's like the law of supply and demand. You want to have, when you put that house on the market, the most number of people interested in buying that house, okay? They've got to be because um, in the best of worlds, what can happen is you have more than one person and they get on a bidding war and, and you make more than what you thought you were on your ARV. So you've got to make it where you, the most people, you don't do anything that, you know, just your own personal um, taste. Now, here's the other thing in conjunction. I say this all the time. Let's say your own personal residence and there might be 10 things you want to do in there. But guess what? As an investor, you probably only can do five. Not 10, five. So you have to figure out where are you going to put your money? And I'm gonna tell you this, it's easy. The number one room that can make or break a deal is the kitchen. The most money you should be spending is on that kitchen. You've got a husband or wife that comes in and they're cooking and they don't like that kitchen. They're walking out the door. They're walking out the door. That room can absolutely make or break it. And then the second thing you wanna make sure you put your uh, money is in the bathroom. Um, and especially like master baths. Um, of course, some of that would depend on the price point of the house, but kitchens and baths are where the money should be going. Again, be very clear, you cannot do everything you probably want in that house. Um, so pick the five or six, but as you're making it, making sure that you do not neglect the um, kitchen or bathrooms. Okay, so after that, let's see. Um, oh, networking, my favorite. All right, so I am passionate about connecting the networking people, right? And so uh, in 2010, um, I created a monthly networking event here in Atlanta called Real Estate Connection. Uh, it's a monthly, the first Thursday of every month. And um, in the nine, October, we are nine year anniversary. We have not missed a single month. Think about that, haven't missed a single month in almost nine years of the event. We averaged over three, hundred people every event. Now, the thing that's so important about networking is this. When you value relationships, you understand that your business will grow. See, you can't do it on your own and you're not going to know everything on your own. So like at Real Estate Connections, of which I will say American IRA is one of our sponsors, everybody there touches a home. So you've got investors, you have people how to finance um, properties, you've got realtors, you've got you know inspectors, you've got property management companies. I mean, everything that you would need for properties. And and uh, as you're an investor, you know it's important that you can figure out how, who's going to find these properties, how you're going to fund them. And so um, you can't have an event that averages over 300 people for our ninth year without people valuing and getting good connections. Um, my goal is 25% of the people in the room are new each and every time. Uh, I met Sable, 
who is the uh, rep here in Atlanta um, at Real Estate Connections. And, um, you know, I, I just love putting people together. So um, if you're here in Atlanta, although I would say this, I have people that fly in from other parts of the country because of the high energy and the quality of people there. So first Thursday, so next Thursday, uh, May 2nd from 6 to 9, we're at Loca Luna. But here's the other thing that I think is really powerful. So about 18 months ago, I wanted to create a national community of people. Now, and so uh, I created on Facebook, and I want people to write this down, the group Real Estate Connections Group. That's Real Estate Connections Group. About 70% are here in Georgia, but other 30% are all over the country. Think about that, over 13,000 people. And everybody really is real estate related. And so it's great information, right? So people can say, I'm, I'm looking for a property, I'm looking to find a property. Um, and so you've got the ability to interact with almost, and every day I add probably 25 or 50 people to the group. And so, you know, another week or something, maybe over 14,000 people. Um, they're engaging. It's a great resource to be able to find, ask. Um, I have people who say, hey, I'm in North Carolina. I'm looking for A, B, or C. I'm looking for a property. I'm looking for this. Um, and so I highly encourage for all of your people to join the Facebook group. Again, it's a real estate connection with an S group. And so if you value relationships, and I always say this, if you don't value relationships, then it's hard to value your company because it is so important. All right, I think, I think, that's, I think that's it for uh, now. All right, so I think it's back to you, Sean. Awesome. Fantastic stuff, Peter. Really appreciate it. Love the energy, too. This, this guy's a dynamo, huh? Um, so in terms of wrapping hey, it was up. Hey, a little bit low energy today. Yeah. yeah, Peter, it's uh, it's just like watching you on TV, man. You are just, uh, you are just Mr. Energy. I love it. Great information too. You know, appreciate you kind of breaking down the analysis of the different types of strategies and how they are pertinent for different investors and what they're looking to accomplish. So, really great stuff. And and uh, certainly moving forward, if you're interested in. Um, and coming back on, as you said, to discuss the four levels of rehab, I think that would be a, a massive value add. Um, so as you look at the self-directed concept, again, for those of you who may be interested in discussing this further with our team, keeping in mind that before you're out there looking for these deals, as Peter mentioned, you need to make sure your house is in order. And so with the retirement accounts, that comes in the form of first opening and funding your retirement account with us. Then you're going to identify the property, the asset that makes sense for your portfolio, and then communicate with, in this case, American IRA, so that we can assist you and give you instructions for how the paperwork flows so that your retirement account can acquire this asset. And then ultimately, the end result is that your IRA or 401k owns the property or makes the loan or whatever that asset may be, it is entitled to the profit associated with the rent rolls or the sale profits or you know the dividends or whatever the asset may be. So um, again, just keeping in mind, you really wanna make sure you're, you're doing things in the correct order there. So again, this is uh, Peter Pasternak, he is uh, really kind of the, the guru, the connector, uh, the one that uh, keeps things moving in Atlanta and brings investors together. And so Peter was nice enough to share an email and a phone number. Uh, so that is Peter at foundationsllc.com. And his phone number is 404-275-8075. Eight zero eight seven, and again, uh, for those of you that are live and have questions, please feel free at this point to type into the questions box. And again, I'm Sean McKay with American IRA. I can be reached at Sean S E A N at American IRA. Certainly, feel free to visit our website AmericanIRA.com, and the Charlotte office number is seven zero four six three three. 8155 
also if you are not in the direct uh, Charlotte area certainly feel free to reach our headquarters and depending upon where you're located they'll be dispersed to um, our sales team and so the Asheville headquarters number is 1-866-7500 IRA which is 472 and uh, Peter if you have a few minutes just uh, wanted to roll through a few questions okay okay all right so the first one is so sean i'm finding that lenders will not loan money to a 401k where are you finding your best source for funding have fifty thousand a uh, lot paid for with water sewer installed and plans ready to build uh, names contact info for lenders okay great so and actually peter did a great job of touching on this concept where retirement accounts can use loans they can use leverage and so as as peter mentioned um, they need to be essentially a non-recourse loan so the account holder you cannot personally guarantee that loan so different strategies will have different lending resources um, for those of you that are more the buy and hold investor uh, you, you're going to be acquiring rental properties uh, the the lender that and I certainly don't get any compensation for saying this but the lender that we see close the most loans for our clients uh, seems to be North American Savings Bank and they are located or excuse me their website is IRALending.com um, certainly if you're doing more of a shorter term deal kind of a, uh, a fix and flip type of scenario um, I do find actually many of the hard money lenders if this works for your business model do tend to not need personal guarantees so effectively that makes it a non-recourse loan and certainly if you're able to raise money from private lenders whether it's retirement accounts or from just individuals with uh, savings um, they can be great resources as they tend to be pretty flexible uh, with their terms and what have you Peter did you have any thoughts on that so um, here's what I would say. You start with what's going to be the least, um, or what can help you achieve the most profitability. So tier one is your self-directed IRAs, right? Because it's your own money. Um, then you start taking a look at what you can do that with conjunction with. So a lot of times you might be able to do that in conjunction with like somebody else's um, uh, IRA self-directed or some, um, some like private money and kind of do that with a joint thing. But if you can't do that, then I will tell you this. Um, there are a, there's a bank product that is available to investors. It's called a, a Fannie Mae Home Style. It's a Fannie Mae Home Style. And not all banks or mortgage companies do that. However, if, and here's the advantage. You're paying typically four, five, um, four and a half to five and a half percent, and maybe a quarter to a point in origination okay um if you're looking for the people that do that i know people that do that you can reach out um then when you start going to hard money and again some of the places you don't have to guarantee so you can use it in conjunction with and so that's what you always have to keep in mind which is better um but you're typically playing eight to fourteen percent um and here's the thing most hard money is going to be tiered by the amount of experience you have so when you first start flipping homes, it's going to cost you more because you haven't done it. And so the more that you do, um, you're going to start getting better rates with that. So start with the first thing I would take a look at is self-directed IRAs because, again, it's your money and there's no interest rate. And so that's where I would start. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, Peter, the next question is for you. Have you invested in mobile homes and what has been your experience? So I have not invested in mobile homes. Um, and the reason I haven't is um, the people I know who have done it have not had great experiences with that. And you're typically, the amount of appreciation you're going to get on that is going to be significantly less than other types of um, real estate. So um, I, would be, I, I would be very careful um, 
about doing that. Okay, great. So Peter, the next one is, uh, what have you found to be the best way to estimate rehab costs? Mm -hmm. All right, so if you reach out to me, I actually have a rehab um, spreadsheet. If you reach out to me and uh, I will have you go to Facebook and put, I have one of those boxes and put it in the repairs, uh, reach out to me and I will send you a, a repair estimator. I have that. But I will, I will tell you this, you have to be careful with that because depending on where you're at, these are stuff that we've come up with, but um, pricing depends on location and pricing go up or not. But it's a great way if you're just trying to get like a general idea um, to use. Okay, great. So the next one is, Peter, how much does it cost to attend your networking events? Okay, so if you're a realtor, you get in free. If you're not a realtor, it's $20 to come to the event. Okay. And if you don't mind, uh, we just have a few more here. Um, what is the best strategy for a newbie investor? So I would say this, a lot of times if you can like joint venture with somebody who has experience, so a lot of people, well, a lot of people fall into this category. Either they have money, <laughs> excuse me, but not time. And you have some people who have time, but not a lot of money. So if you're beginning and, um, you know, let's say you don't have a lot of resources, um, but you're willing to work. Uh, you might find some people who have money that might do some type of joint venture. And if you've got the person, you've got money, but not, um, you know, a lot of experience, then take a look at somebody who's done this. And I will tell you this, as an investor, you never have enough money. I say that all the time. You never have enough money because there are always deals you want to get done. And so uh, never say no to somebody who is interested in partnering with you or has some form of financing. Makes sense. And uh, if you don't mind, just one last question here. Um, this individual says, I've read it isn't safe to invest in a smaller city. And then uh, they, they say, I live in uh, Lancaster, South Carolina. So what should I do? So essentially, if you're in a smaller city, what what's the play there? Okay. So <clears throat> I will say this. I think you can make money in any location uh, if the numbers work out. But let's say you, for some reason or not, you think that they can't, then um, what you find is most cities have a RIA, which is a real estate investing like association, right? And so I would join one of those um, or get online. I mean, here's the thing, you get on the Real Estate Connection Group. I've got 14,000 people. Um, all over the country and say, where are the, where are the investors like um, finding the deals? And you will get probably 25 or 50 responses, right? And so if you don't know, ask, and you're going to get some really good information. Beautiful. Well, again, Peter, really appreciate the, uh, the, the value in terms of the information. Certainly, uh, we got a number of comments that uh, this was extremely entertaining as well. So really appreciate uh, <laughs> you keeping it uh, light. And um, again, thank you so much. Uh, a lot of, lot of positive comments about uh, how happy they were we were able to get you on. So any, any closing thoughts for the group? Uh, no, here's the thing. Just remember, if you wait until the time is perfect, it never happens. So um, when it comes to investing, get yourself good information and don't wait too long. So those are my parting words. Love it. Love it. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, if you've uh, joined us live, a lot of great questions and comments. Thank you for all of that. Again, Peter Pasternak. Um, phenomenal resource and as he said certainly the atlanta area uh, he does a lot of networking and he's also expanding his reach with online platforms and what have you for real estate connections uh, so certainly feel free to check that out 
And uh, hopefully we'll see you all again at a live event or a webinar soon. And uh, have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank mm -hmm. you.